it's embarrassing when you get pulled over. <laughs> More like, I mean, at this point, we don't care about the stupid, you know, you can do occult stuff, whatever. But the Nazi thing, it's like, that's a little bit embarrassing. Yeah, no, I, th- I think he was deeply embarrassed by it, but. He's David Bowie. Was David Bowie. Rest in peace, bud. Well, that's interesting you mentioned that. Because much like, you know, a great song like that being sort of uh, tainted, you might say, and a great artist like that being quote-unquote tainted by the presence of Nazis, we're going to talk about a movie today where something that on the surface looks fine and looks okay is tainted. And it's hiding something sinister beneath. And surprisingly, for the first time in weeks... This movie actually doesn't have Nazis <laughs> in it. Well, um, we well let's wait until it. we watch it today. And maybe we'll find something. <laughs> and today you can dial S for the Spectator Film Podcast. Oh, that was good, Austin. I mean, I guess you're going to have to, if you're listening to this on a <laughs> fucking rotary phone, <laughs> that'd be interesting. Well, they still have numbers on the phones. You can In their podcast app. Yes, um... On a rotary phone. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max. I'm... <laughs> yeah, Austin couldn't make it today, so I hired an Eldritch Horror to take his place. You should hardly I'm notice the I'm a time difference. wizard from the planet of... And... Uh, Did you, you do cocaine <laughs> before this podcast? <laughs> well, we were talking about it for a reason, weren't we? Um, anyway, this was my pick. Uh, this is my my planet's favorite movie. Uh, oh, I don't we're, know. We're doing Dial M for Murder. We we should probably clarify. Oh yeah, that. we didn't say that. Yes, yeah, by Dial Alfred M Hitchcock. for Murder. Yeah, nineteen fifty four. Yes, the same year he made Rear Window, yes. and that's quite a quite a Excellent. double hander for that yeah. year. Um, even though he did make this the year prior, and then was um, delayed because this was a play, as I'm sure will be clear to many of you while watching the movie. This was a play that was adapted into a film, and they had to finish the runtime of the play before it was premiered in theaters um but like i said this was my pick and uh i don't know i don't really know why i picked this movie this week um i think i was just like interested in doing maybe a hitchcock movie and uh since we did strangers on a train which as max and i have discussed multiple times is sort of like a very default feeling hitchcock movie yeah um it was interesting to do something that's a little bit more off the beaten path i would say it might be a little i I would rather rewatch Strangers on a Train than this movie, but I do think that this one, like, it's slightly more complicated and slightly, like, more layers to peel back than Strangers on a Train. But right. I, I don't think, think that makes it better. I just Yeah, it's a weird question. I think maybe this one's more interesting. And definitely, I think Strangers on a Train, there's, like, it sort of presents itself to you more. Yeah. Strangers on a Train is maybe a little bit more audience-friendly. Not that this is, like not like entertaining, but there's lots of layers to this. And it's all about like, how much do you enjoy like picking through the interesting games being played in this movie? And like, you know, like we were saying that subterranean secondary meaning that you can find in a lot of things, whether it's dialogue shots or uh, character behaviors, right? Yes. It's very interesting. And um, I think uh, part of the reason why, uh, this movie is kind of dismissed is maybe because it was in 3D, which was kind of a gimmick at and the time. Glorious 3D, three dimensional. And it was such a f- like momentary fad that it la- it didn't even last the year. It was in 1953 and it was popular popularized by House of Wax, I think, was the first one. Oh that, my God, yeah. Yeah, with uh, by Andre de Toth. That movie is insane. And he's an insane director. We should do that movie because he would torture his cast in weird ways. Um, I think the remake of House of Wax actually was in 3D too. <laughs> with Harris Pilton? Yeah. Or uh, I think... or <laughs> With our favorite actor, Harris Pilton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Paris Hilton. Yes, yes thank you. Um, do I have some sort of psychological problem? I do that often. I think you're just trying to slowly block out our Repo the Genetic Opera episode from your mind. And it's... Oh, and I mix it up. <laughs> yeah. I just the words, I try to switch them to make new words that yeah. mean different things. Yeah. But uh, but yes, so that was what started it off. And then our buddy Jack Arnold got on the boat and he made, I think, several. And then that was it. And this movie was shot in 3D, but it was never shown in 3D. Um, and we are not going to be watching it in 3D, so we may be missing something, but we're going to do the best we can. Well, at the very least, there's no, like, annoying gimmicks of just, like, look, the scissors are coming back, <laughs> and they're yeah. in the screen now. Ooh, like, 
but also it's kind of because there aren't annoying gimmicks. It makes me wonder. There's a lot of like very shallow depth of field images. Yeah. Where it's like, um, there's one we're going to point out with like Grace Kelly's face. It's like very, very shallow. And I'm like, does that look really different in 3D? Yeah. You know? And there are some scenes where it looks like it, these are few and far between because I would say that the camera work for the most part is this movie's strongest feature. Yeah, it's great. For me. Um, but there are some scenes where it's just like, why are the main characters out of focus in the liquor cabinet in focus? I don't yep. I don't get yep. this. Is this because it was supposed to be in 3D and they were yeah. supposed to be closer to you? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of that might be part of the reason why even though there's tons of criticism and discussion of this movie, as there is with all of Hitchcock's movies, because that's just the way it is, it is, I think, sort of neglected in that study. And I think it shouldn't be. I think it's very interesting. And um, I can't remember the first time I watched it. I think I watched it probably when I was like five, six, seven, or eight. Uh, it was a period of my my life when my mom would would sit me down and watch TCM movies. <laughs> And uh, a lot of like Hitchcock ones were the ones I would remember that like fucking uh, Mr. Limpet, which oh, was yes. weird. It was really weird as a Limpet. kid watching that movie and Don Limpet Knotts. Good. He turns into a fish and then he starts fucking a fish. As one does. And he's married. The movie was ahead of the time. It's a prequel to The Shape of Water. Um, you know, that'd be interesting. It would be interesting to see a Don because Don Knotts kind of looks like a fish, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Um. I want to see a remake of Don Knotts. You do it in the Rogue One, uh, Peter Cushing style, but it's Shape of Water. So it's Shape of Water with revived Don Knotts, and he's fucking a fish man. Let's make it happen. Um, weirdly Paul enough, Guillermo. <laughs> weirdly enough, that was Guillermo del Toro's original draft of Rogue One. It was very interesting. Boo. Very interesting. Uh, but anyway, that's that's my experience with mo- this movie. I watched it then. And uh, it was one of those Hitchcock movies I remembered. And then I watched it, you know, years later after I started getting into movies and I thought it was decent and not that great. But watching this week, I think it revealed some more interesting things that I enjoy about it. How about you? Uh, For me, I saw this movie the first time, I believe I was 15 in a high school media studies class. Um, We were supposed to watch a bunch of old directors and like slowly progress into the modern era to like give us a very, very, very vague understanding the history of filmmaking as a high school media class yeah. can do uh instead we watched a bunch of hitchcock movies for the majority of the semester um, yeah you said your your teacher ended up just like getting drunk in the corner and being like <laughs> we're gonna watch a movie kids yeah uh so i saw four hitchcock movies in that thing um this is the one i remember the least about but that i mean yeah in comparison to some other ones that makes sense we watched because like we, we watched what was it, the bird psycho and rear window and also this one like i remember not even liking the birds that much i'd seen it before but like the birds left a bigger impact on me than this did when you I weren't was like 15. a gore hound uh i have 15 was, you didn't like those pecked out eyeballs I, I was actually 15 is when i started really getting into slasher movies um so <laughs> I figure, like... And not coincidentally, it was the year Max learned how to start masturbating. Those two things are related. Anyway, um... But... I was... So I just, like, got into my slash movie phase, so this one, like, with its almost, like, it's very shouted dark murder and a lot of talking kind of faded away from me. Um, and then... Aust- I had literally not watched it until Austin was just like, hey... Let's do Dial M for Murder, uh, which I didn't really have any strong objections to because, I mean, I forced him to watch Hellboy, which he ended up enjoying, but still, like, we need to go back. Was the assumption that I didn't like Hellboy? I was assuming that, honestly, going into Hellboy, I thought it was going to be, like, this is done by visionary director Guillermo del Toro, but it's still a superhero movie, so I don't like it for this, but you can see his directorial flourishes here. I was actually really surprised with how much you ended up enjoying Hellboy. So. Well, I'm not dogmatic about things, Max. Excuse me. Okay. Um, anyway. My distaste of superhero movies is justified, and now that you have accused me of being biased, I will then rant on my soapbox for 45 minutes before we begin the movie. This is what's going to happen. Anyway, uh, so yeah, I rewatched this. I still don't hold it as one of my favorite Hitchcock movies. I think I discussed with Austin already. I don't even enjoy it 
It's not in my top five. It's okay to talk Max, about. Max, rank all the Hitchcock movies. Go. <laughs> okay. Um. First off. Uh, You're a big fan of murder. Psych- yeah, Psycho, Strangers on a Train. Uh, I think Flubber was a bit of a departure from his previous <laughs> work. Quite different. <laughs> but I really liked it's that very one. very strange. You should have seen Guillermo del Toro's original draft of Flubber. <laughs> that was really interesting. That collaboration would have been great. But I think... It's very fascinating using almost Hitchcockian camera work and lighting to elevate what otherwise I would say is a pretty standard movie adaptation of a stage play. Yeah. Um, I really like those elements. I think the movie does drag a little bit in the second half, but I think the first half is really well paced and the acting is charming and the dialogue is fast, yeah, fast paced and back and forth enough that it's very good. Um, I think after we know what happened and we're waiting for the rest of the characters to catch up, and as we know as the audience that the movie's not going to end with him getting away with his dastardly act with no karmatic re- yeah, retribution, because that's not right. how movies came, yeah, were back then. Especially not Hitchcock movies. Yes. Yeah. Like, I think the ending of the movie it leaves a little bit to be desired, but I think it's a perfectly fun Hitchcock film and one worth diving into. Yeah, I think I think... I agree. You know, I think um, it's sort of hard to really, for me to really rank a lot of them because some, some are just not good, but like some like this, where it's like, I, I do see it, like you said, you used the word dive into it. I do see it kind of like a pool, this yeah. movie, where it's like you can pick out a lot of interesting things. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that for me gives it a little bit more longevity than something maybe like Strangers on a Train, which is feels more plotted in a specific way where it's this is like it's not unsettled kind of by the ending i don't always feel like i have a good grip on this movie but in a way that i find interesting i feel like i might be more willing to revisit this movie you know because i find the performance is so interesting it's just those diamond dynamics but but yeah i'm you know i think uh i think this movie is i was gonna say it's actually my least favorite of his 50 stuff but uh that's not true at all because I don't think uh, To Catch a Thief, if I remember correctly, is quite as good as this. And I don't uh, enjoy The Trouble with Harry quite as much either. But yeah, so aside from that, it's on the weaker end of his stuff in the 50s, which is quite good. But uh, that's that's not too much of a... That's saying something yeah. about how good his movies are, because I still think it's a, a very good movie. So are you ready, sir, to dial M for murder? Let's go. Oh, right. wait, I don't, I don't what? have quarters for the payphone. Fine. Oh, well, we don't have a payphone here. We've got to find one. Uh, Patreon. Yeah, support us on Patreon so we can afford to dial the payphone and dial M for murder. And get somebody to write some transitions for us. Let's go! And here's the film. Yes, Warner Brothers movie. We need to stop doing that. We do that way too much. I've what? Noticed. Just... Just observing the facts of the production company. Because how do you start a commentary track? <laughs> I mean, all the people who actually worked on the movie, that's how they start it. Yeah. They're like, oh, no, oh you know, I'm uh, I'm J.J. Abrams, and I made this movie. And uh, this is a Warner Brothers movie, as uh, you're seeing on the screen. And it's like that for two hours. <laughs> Well, that's because that was a section of their contract they didn't read when they signed. And, and that's why on all there. those commentary tracks, they're like, oh, it was cold that night. Yeah. And the, uh, that, you know, you see, see those leaves, they were dropped by Bob. He's yeah. a really nice guy. Yeah, so he, he was great. He was the best uh, grip that we had on the thing. Um, we did have to fire him for that, though, because those leaves were supposed to be on the other side of the shot. Uh, that, that was very unfortunate. Yeah. And uh, definitely don't hire him. Yeah. Don't hire him if you're going to make a movie. Bob's and Jenkins, you don't want to. You know who you should hire? Alfred Hitchcock? No, Dimitri Tiomkin. Okay. He's a Oscar winning, or did he win? Definitely Oscar-nominated classical composer from uh, classic Hollywood, and it's great. But already in this movie, we're seeing the the standard Hitchcockian uh, stuff built immediately. We have the image of the police officer. We have the happy and the couple facade. We have yeah. The, and well, then we have a nearly identical happy-looking couple inside the house. Well, here's the point of this. This is the point of departure for all Hitchcock movies, right? This is why they're all very similar, is they play with this idea of surface and subterranean. Right. So you have phrases that would surmise uh, sort of 
the surface level idea of things. It's the expectation of reality as it should be in quotes, right? So you have this happy couple facade police officer, right? Um, and it's sort of this idea of conventions, right? The most conventional thing ever. This is why his movies are always about what at the time people would call petty bourgeois people, yeah. right? White people, people who, uh, rich people problems, TM. Right. Sort of. Cause a lot of the time money motivates things, but it's yeah. like, it's all about appeasing this like ideal vision of society. Right. And then all his movies move past that facade and then investigate some sinister secondary meaning. And already here we have the sinister meaning behind the facade of this house is that Grace Kelly is having an affair with this dude. Yes. And we know that from the, the two fades, right, of them kissing. And her looking up and just being like from the newspaper after we zoom in on the name of this author. Yeah. And uh, yes, so this is the first stain is a phrase that people use to often... Uh, describe how you access that sinister meaning that is like behind an object, right? And it's very important that we say it's behind or within an object because basically if you look at, he, he plays with images, Hitchcock, right? So he's playing with the image of the ideal marriage. But what's the stain that is like behind the image of an ideal marriage? And you can get more st- specific with it, right? In this movie, we're going to see a lot of objects change hands. What's the sinister meaning behind this object, Right. Or the fact that this person has this object. I think later on in a scene, we yeah get a perfect explanation of that. And we'll return to that then. Although, right. as we're introducing characters, I do want to talk about something real quick. Yeah. Something that in rewatching it, I was kind of disappointed by. He. By the way, this is that shot I mentioned with the really shallow focus yeah. on her face. Um. So her the man she's cheating on her husband with, Mm -hmm. he writes crime novels for a living. And you think in a murder mystery movie, like that would play a bigger role, but it doesn't really. He is, he has the one exposition thing where he's just like, Oh, I think I could commit murder, but I don't think I could bring myself to do it because things always don't always go perfectly. You're doing the stories, which is a nice little setup for later on when things don't go perfect. Right. And then at the end, we're to assume that he uses his, skills to like basically pin down almost exactly what the husband actually did. But that's what brings him there. But really it's only that he overheard him tell a lie. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's not like those skills really come to use, which is weird. Cause like if you're going to, why do you establish that? Well, it's interesting because I think it is all playing with this idea that we're going to introduce about like creating fiction. Right. And again, like we're talking about the idea of that perfect reality or those images that work the way they're supposed to. Because we, when we say perfect, it's a lazy way of describing something that's a little bit more specific, right? It's saying things operating as they should, right? Um, phrases you can describe this. Uh, sort of uh, policed legality is a phrase. Um, public formality, right? Okay. It's the idea of the public uh, public's eye on you, Right. And how are you supposed to behave in public, right? There's a code of conduct that is unsaid. You know what I'm saying? And everything has to adhere to an ideal image of something as the way it's supposed to be. And uh, that's what a lot of his movies play with, right? That's why blackmail shows up in so many of his movies because it's not just that you did something wrong. It's that I'm threatening you to reveal you to not be... The, like part of the facade you're putting up to the public. It's I, performative. Drama. Yeah, I get that. And, uh, and this is an interesting moment too. I don't know if you noticed, but look at the foreground drinks. Yes. Booze. We crossed the 180 line already. Or did we? We're going to, uh, he shoots this stage area from all over. And right now we're actually looking at them from behind a wall. There should be a wall right there. It's kind of interesting, right? The fourth wall. Um, right. Well, it's interesting. The fourth wall and a lot of these, these setups changes rapidly. Um, he's very in control of this space and how he's filming it. And we'll see that more once characters start like, I don't know, volleying arguments back at one another. Cause I think the camera work, work does a really good job of like following the momentum of arguments and discussions. Uh, but even here, it's interesting where 
Um, I don't even know if we're going to return to this setup again later in the movie. No, I don't. I hate that. What? The the it, 50s. The 50s, like, woman trying to get away, but yeah. I'm embracing you with my strong man arms, mm-hmm. and then you instantly fall into yeah. a lover's embrace. It's very me. awkward and stupid. But that's an interesting moment. I like that cut. They introduce him with sound coming from off screen, right? And you see the shadows part. Yes, and they're completely on the other sides of the room, and... Also completely colored differently. We have the bright, vibrant red dress to the dark black suit. Um, That's the other interesting thing you can learn f- about this movie from uh, from uh, Truffaut's Hitchcock book, where he's interviewing him, and he just throws out some detail about how they changed Grace, Kelly, Grace Kelly's uh, outfits from brighter to more dour throughout the course of the movie. Her character sucks in this, by the way. Yeah. She really is the least proactive Hitchcock heroine Which is that weird. I can possibly yeah, think of. I was, I was just going to say, just like, Women, yeah, women aren't always amazingly written in Hitchcock movies, but he does have a lot of great written women in there. Um, well, it's like the idea of whether or not people think they're great. Like a lot of them are doing things. Yes, they're active you know, in the story, and like even trying- if they're getting like punished in a way where it's kind of like weird, you know, or it's like off putting, and it makes you wonder about the sadism of them being punished. Rarely are they so passive in the process of their own punishment as they are in this movie, well, as Grace the, Kelly is in this movie. So the most like famous example, you have Psycho, where like you start off with this female heroine who's trying to, like she did a bad thing, but like right. she realized what she did was wrong and she was going to go and amend her sins, and then she's killed off anyway. But like, right. that was more of a just like a jolt to be like, this isn't going to be a stereotypical Hitchcock, like almost morality play type right. thing. Well, even in this one, Like, the same year, Grace Kelly was in Rear Window, right? And there's lots of criticism on that movie where is it like, how are we eliciting drama from the audience? Because that movie obviously is very concerned with the male gaze, right? But in that one, she's very proactive in that. She's also, at a certain point, peeping with Jimmy Stewart and getting on board with this and breaking into somebody's apartment. The person they think is a killer. Yeah, yeah. In this, it's just like, oh, God, I don't know. And then she's just useless. She's useless. Well, she does kill somebody, so I'll give her that. And literally the thing at the end that like even saves her is like, she's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And the director's like, or no. The, and the inspector is <laughs> the like. The screenwriter is like. <laughs> the inspector's like, no, I don't think you do. <laughs> That's the thing that saves her. She's such a like passive, like non-character, you know? It's so weird. It's yeah. it's weird that she seems so useless, you know? She's definitely like... An, she's not the master of her own fate in any She's aspect. just an object. Yeah, no, she's something to be passed around. So it's just like... Although, I do want to know what the fuck the legal system is in this movie, as we'll get we'll back we'll to get later. We'll get to that, yeah. yeah. But this is the interesting turn, right? Because at this point, as far as we know, we might be sympathizing with Ray Milland here, who, yeah. welcome back to the podcast, Ray Milland. We yes. might remember him from Ministry of Fear, that great episode. Ooh, Wow, that was a while ago. Yeah. Um, but as we can see, he has already lied, right? Yes. I'm not on the phone with my boss. I'm calling about a car for some reason. Well, we don't know if he's somehow doing something to try to track his wife or whatever it is. It's not necessarily as sinister as it's going no, to be. No, but we know he's not doing what he said he was going to do. Right. And, and th- he lied about his name on the phone. Yes. Uh, Fisher yes. in a very wink, wink, clever naming thing he is trying to get mr captain lesgit yeah. on his hook and he does quite effectively as we'll see uh and this is maybe where you really start to perhaps start to be suspicious right because why does he need this to perhaps tail his wife or something why does he this is my favorite scene in the movie though oh yes this sequence is actually wonderful it's brilliant if you're paying attention to things like it everything little thing pays off everything is motivated yes every choice like this this shot we get the stuff with the this sort of like a hip level shot but also it's kind of like dramatic low angle we get the cut and we see captain lesget we'll come we'll come back to that but there's lots of i don't even know if we'll be able to keep up with it but this scene is 22 minutes long and there's so many intricacies in how he manipulates this guy that it's kind of like insane. And it's just so cleverly set up and well acted that I just want to watch the scene over and over again, you know? 
And I also think that's part of the the reason why this scene might this movie might feel a little bit long at the end is because you've had this great scene, right? And it sets everything up. And as much as I love uh, our inspector, John Williams, later in this movie, it's not as intense of a back and forth conversation like this. Yeah. But we have we have him as, well, I don't have we established he's a tennis champion yet? Or well he was? Not quite yet. Well, Grace Kelly mentioned something yes. along those lines. But that's a very useful metaphor for the dialogue that's about to come up. Yeah, because it is definitely like gamesmanship, right? In terms yeah. of maneuvering past one another socially. Um, and already here we see the camera track checking with Lesget, right? And he isolates himself to the right of the frame as he's suspicious. And we don't know why he might be suspicious yet, but we will soon, right? This is what we're talking about, too, with Hitchcock in his movies, constructing drama out of images that are not what they're supposing to be, where he's there supposedly selling a car. But actually, he's selling a car at a marked-up price from what the woman is asking for. Why is he doing that? Oh, if you dig a little bit deeper, he's not a good guy. Yeah. I do kind of feel bad for Leskin. (laughs) He walks in thinking he's going to make a quick buck off of an idiot who wants to buy a car. Yeah. Gets well, blackmailed into murder. I think that is a good way too of like really selling how dangerous Ray Meland is, yeah. you know, because he just fucking, Oh, there's Hitchcock, by the way, oh, this picture is very funny to me. That very inconspicuous cameo. I like, mean, it's obviously pasted over. Yeah. But also like not Hitchcock's head, but there are heads, but like fucking, <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, Hitchcock is just like, yes, I am same age as these people. I would be at a college reunion. I mean, they're all different ages. Yeah. I mean, how old is Ray Milland compared to Grace Kelly? I don't know. Poor old Alfred. And this is the thing, too, where the maneuvering is so passive aggressive. We missed it earlier, but there's a great line that really describes a great quality of Hitchcock cinema, where the writer guy says, it'll be a brutal evening, us saying nice things to each other the entire time. Right? Because it's all that secondary subterranean meaning that like adds like the knife stabbing part of just like the surface level meeting, you know? But yeah, the even if we're continuing on with the tennis metaphor, the way this shot is edited, it is just shot reverse shot over and over again, but like it's done in rapid suggestion while they're talking. Well, also it's done with strategic shot reverse shot. No, it's not one to one. It's like not yeah mirrored but but it it will then break to wide shots and then the camera will move and track with them and follow them around in a way that will better oh that's a continuity continuity error i hadn't noticed that did you see that he was messing with his hands then he has his head on his uh cane also i think the pipe was in his mouth in one shot and not in the other but i mean it it just goes to show you how unimportant continuity is in a lot of these you cut for emotion is the is the most important thing. If you can communicate how a character is feeling so the audience gets it, that is always the most important thing to uh, to cut for rather than continuity. And here's an interesting part too, where we're going to see Ray Milland very slyly like perform and act out the story he tells with yeah. his body. And it's interesting because uh, this is very much something that I think gives us the feeling of a stage play but does so in a way that really accentuates it with the camera work, right? Because when you have the camera work following these people as they're making your arguments, but you still allow the stage theatricality element of it to be like powerful and palpable in the scene, all you're doing is making, you're accentuating the theater stuff, you know? Instead of movies that adapt stage plays and then try to like, in the Truffaut book, they describe it as quote unquote, opening it up. Yeah. Meaning they remove the action from the stage. Which is I, I can I give an example of a contemporary or slightly yeah, contemporary movie it. that did that um the movie Into the Woods, which is in itself like a fun but like slightly quirky and dark retelling of a bunch of different fairy tales mismatched into the same world. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching an interview with the director of that movie. The movie's okay. It's not yeah. great, but like um the director's just like, Oh, turning it into a film gives us so many opportunities to do things that you just can't do on a stage play. And it's just like the things he's talking about is mainly like making CGI giants and whatnot to like just show these things. Right. The stage play itself was popular for a reason. You don't need to add all these big budget Hollywood right. things. Right. Is, is it the question of doing it literally yeah. or doing what the stage, because it's a theater production, 
and t- occurs on one stage, is it a question of doing that better, right? Like this shot, right? Very conspicuous, conspicuous shot, which is very obvious where he's like, and then I saw something. And then we get this very obvious pan towards yeah. Lesgit here, right? And he doesn't get it yet, but we get it now. He yes. saw Lesgit, right? But that's not something that you have to literally show him at the bar looking at Lesgit. Yeah, for. if you did like a, fl- a blurry effect flashback to just like, I was at the bar. Da-da-da-da. That's the stupid way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And there are ways to do that, but then you have to find a new way to make it interesting. And if you're just making that decision because that's the default thing to do, then you're probably not going to make that other clever decision anyway. No, the fact that, like, I'm not sure if it was genius or laziness on the part of the screenwriter of this film to just basically keep all the settings the same as they presumably were in the stage play. I mean, I think that was Hitchcock's decision. Yeah, um, but the fact that you accentuate the fact which really could there have been bad stage play adaptations where they keep it very similar and it is just insufferable it's just like okay i'm looking at the same shot of these characters moving around i would have seen a play if i wanted to. well that's the other challenge right and by the way he's just he's fucked he doesn't know yet but he's now fucked because he's put his fingerprints on that little moment yeah and he's got the little smile too this is the perfect hitchcockian thing right where this guy thinks he's getting into this conversation, but it's far more sinister than he thinks, even though it's quite sinister already, despite the fact that they're talking about it like they are just doing small talk over the sale of a car, right? And let's not forget, Lesgit came here, or Swan, as we now know his name is, he came here looking for money for a car. He came here to make a deal with somebody, that's exactly what he's going to get when he gets here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's the thing with Hitchcock is he always plays with that surface versus subtext And he does get dynamic. the money that he wanted. He gets 100 advance and 1,000 at completion. Yes, I was going to say that. I was thinking about it today, and I'm like, wait, he got the same exact amount of money that he was there for. Yeah, which is a clever little thing. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of that in Hitchcock movies. And, of course, now that he's mentioned this and insulted him, he now feels the need to leave. Of course, he wouldn't... Ray Meland wouldn't go all out and talk about the murder stuff or even reveal the knowledge of his murders right away because that would aggravate him and he'd just go, right? But now that he's got him lured, he can he can make everything different. And that's a key moment, too, where he says, and now everything changes, right? And he puts his cane down and it's like, now th- things certainly have changed, right? And now Lizgit starts to realize that he's screwed. And this is also where Ray Meland starts to be not just passive aggressive, but just say shitty things to his face. Yeah. And it's also clear here that Ray Meland has the intent of killing his wife now. Well, no, he's being very, very open about it. But at the same time, he's not. At no point in this scene does he ever say or ask him to kill his wife. He always used veiled terms, right? Or he gets Swan to say that himself. You know what I mean? He doesn't even have to get, put himself in a place where he, where he has to say it. It's very clever. Influence you. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting how, how much this movie is just about like creating fictions, right? Because ultimately that's what, that's what those images are, right? When you see something that you think is not, that you think is innocent, right? When you see the man who's coming to you to sell that car, that's kind of a fiction, right? That image of that man. Just as it is being suspicious of that man for no reason that he is also a murderer who steals money, right? You assume it's the good thing because that's the way things are, right? Well, it's constantly shifting who your sympathies lie with in this movie, which I think is... Because, like, initially you start off mad at the wife because she's having an extramarital affair, which is a shitty thing to do. Right. Don't, don't cheat on people. Um, but then we learned that this guy already knows has been planning a very convoluted, in-depth murder for a long time. Yep. It just goes back and forth, right? And, again, so, like, what I'm talking about, the idea of Ray Meland as the innocent husband is a, fiction, is a fiction we have in our mind until we learn the truth, Right. But also, this is a fiction, and as long as there's no physical evidence for it, it remains a fiction. This is the interesting thing about Hitchcock, where it's like all the social reality that we construct is a fiction, and then how 
different people in his movies can use that to their advantage to exploit or endanger other people or get what they want in a way that's like very frightening. And that's why the police are very frightening in his movies because they enforce that reality. And if you are in a wrong man situation, it's very scary in a Hitchcock movie because there's phys- usually physical evidence against you. And it's all circumstantial because all his movies are about like the social reality being contorted against you. But that doesn't make it any less palpable. That's why his movies are like thrilling. That's why a sequence like this is thrilling because you're just learning the extent to which this guy is fucked. And definitely that's something that, that you start to realize with this composition, which it's, it's just very like geometric with the uh, fireplace sort of at a diagonal, like right across his head with the trophies. You can tell that he's, he's screwed now. He's got him by the balls. Yeah. And also in terms of other interesting compositions, definitely the desk in this sequence sticks out to me where Ray Milland goes over there as he starts to really like hammer out the evidence he has against him and, and what he uses to make him stuck. Right. And those, those curtains I think are very like vertical and lit specifically has an air of authority about it. That's very intimidating. I think it's like a distinct shift. Now, let me ask, do you have a favorite performance in this movie? Uh, um, it's probably him, honestly. Yeah. Like, even though, uh, obviously, his character is terrible, and you're kind of supposed to hate him as well. Like, but it's a strong character. It's a strong character for the majority of it. Um, he revels in just like how many details and how perfectly thought out his plan is early on. And then he starts reveling in the fact that even though it flopped, he still manages to weasel his way into getting it. Um. He's given less of a time to shine when the boring inspector shows up to be less like, I'm Mr. Lawman, and this is what happened. Yeah, again, that's probably part of why I prefer scenes like this, because it's a very intense and focused one-on-one yes. sort of battle going on. And uh, well, we only really the third have, one, it's more like it's less focused. We have five characters the second in this half. movie. Like, the inspector, this guy, yeah, or mm-hmm. uh, Grace Kelly, and boyfriend. Yes. And so it's not like there's a plethora of different characters to choose from. And like out of those five, I don't see anybody arguing that he doesn't have the strongest performance in the movie. But to be fair, he's also given the most to work with. So it's a little skewed. But that's just the way the ball rolls. Well, you mentioned something that I I thought was interesting and now I can't remember it. Say everything you just said again. Can you do that? What, that he's given the most to work with? Before that? There's only five characters in this movie. Before that? I don't know. (laughs) Oh, well, I guess we're good for nothing. But... So you see him, because his whole deal is he's good at weaseling out of everything. Like, we've established, it's like, oh, he keeps jumping from this and missing rent and then changing names, changing appearance, and now he's trying to woo this wealthy woman so he can live with her forever, basically, because she has apartments (laughs) and hotels and whatnot. Yeah, but it's interesting, too, because it's like. Also, we're in terms of this fiction, right, we it's validated for us, the audience, by the way that Swan behaves. Right. But also. The the interesting thing about it is that he's so suggestive about everything that there's some sort of intimate knowledge between them two. We don't actually know the true details of how everything happened. It is very clearly implied that poor Miss Wallace died of an overdose. Or no, he does say that outright, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. But the point is, we're supposed to know for a fact that Swan has done that. But as far as other things that have been done, we don't know the true extent of, of like exactly the accuracy of what he's saying. We assume it's accurate and I think it's okay to make that assumption. But the interesting thing about it is how that's still an image and we, the, how that reflects on Ray Milland, right? We are now assuming that Swan is the criminal and Ray Milland is using him, right? But the interesting thing about this is that Ray Milland is no different from him after all, because they do the same thing. The only difference is Ray Milland is able to do it for longer. Yeah. Right. Well, and he's not really doing it out of a need for survival. He's doing it for personal gain. Right. Just purely out of like a sense of masochism and control and sort of. Yeah. Whereas like 
Swan does it because he needs it to survive. And it. that's the interesting thing about him being the tennis player. Yeah. Is like you just see him as somebody, he, he talks about how he was good at in tennis, right? Yeah. And maybe Hitchcock has a thing against tennis players. But uh, we're now two for two on main characters being Hitch, uh, tennis players and Hitchcock things. Well, it's a hero in Strangers on a Train. Yeah, at but least. the movie is also like this guy's a dumbass. Yeah. And also it's like, it's like he's going to be a senator now. This stupid idiot. Is he going to be a senator or is he just a senator's son? I forget about son-in-law. Okay. But he's being groomed, Max. And, uh, you know, I, I think this that movie doesn't have a great, like, feeling about that character. It doesn't have a very high opinion of At him. At the very least, it doesn't have a gratuitous tennis scene. That, uh, oh, you mean this one? Yeah, this yeah. one doesn't have a gratuitous But it is interesting scene. that guy basically is doing the same thing, right? Yeah. He's marrying into money and prestige much like Raymond Land, right? And at, at the same time, even though it's a different dynamic, Guy is the one that gets approached by Bruno. It is Bruno articulating things that Guy feels. They're not necessarily too different and to a certain extent, you know? Um, only a madman would scream, I want to strangle her, like several times over and over to their girlfriend when referring to their ex-wife. On a public phone. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so we... There I wish she would be murdered on... <laughs> It's we come like, here to have sex island in the carnival. <laughs> Specifically there. If only that happened. <laughs> oh my God. But we've seen two interesting camera moves that we've talked over. The first one with the money, which is a swish move, right? And it's the most dramatic camera move in this entire sequence so far. And I think it's important because uh, the money is now physical evidence of all the fiction we've been writing between these two characters. These two characters and more specifically Ray Milland, uh, the sort of story they've been weaving, right, which Swan knows is true, Yes, um, is, is something that really feels like it's starting to feel real when there's actual money because now it's real. And this is going to be the introduction to the use of Hitchcockian objects in this movie, which I guess we can call exchange objects. I don't know what the preferred real term of it would be, but it's not a MacGuffin. We'll talk about it more once they come in more into play. But yes, uh, they are not MacGuffins. There are multiple types of Hitchcockian objects, and these are a second type, uh, which are more specific in their function in a plot than MacGuffins. They're and, not just yeah, an excuse for the less plot. Less annoying. But the other interesting thing, camera move is this transition to this overhead shot, which is very different from everything we've seen so far. Because so far we've sort of been with our boots on the ground with the characters. And the camera movement, I think, has been motivated by their emotions and the logic of the argument. But now it's like this overhead shot, and it feels much more like, I don't know, schematic. They're going over the half of the plan that is less important, I think, because we get some details of what will happen, but a lot of what they talk about never happens. You know what I mean? They never get to that point of the plan. Yeah. So at that point... It's like we have passed the point where he has to convince him and now we're merely getting exposition about how it's going to happen, right? And uh, this is definitely the most dramatic lighting too, this shot. Whenever they're behind the desk and they have the curtains, that's like where things start to get real emotionally where it's like we're really going to do this. And it's not, it's not coincidental that that's also the site of the murder. That's exactly where she's going to be standing. And that lighting is much more dramatic than the rest of this room. But also what that overhead shot does, I think, is like accentuate the idea of this being a stage. Yeah, no, this, I mean, 90% of the movie takes place in the apartment. Yeah, um, but it's also very stagey. Like everything we're saying with this back and forth is a very stagey thing that they're doing. Yes. That's and why it's okay to call it like authoring fiction. I didn't even notice because you pointed out the scene goes on for 22 minutes. Yeah. Which like if you try to pitch like a singular dialogue scene in a singular location for 22 minutes to an executive today, they'll spit in your face. Yeah. Like, but I didn't even know <laughs> they'll shit in their hands yeah. and they'll throw it at you <laughs> and they'll get out. I didn't even notice that rewatching this. Like this scene yeah. seemed to go by so quickly just because like there's so much tension and back and forth and excellent camera work. It's 100% the acting yeah. and the director. There's so many like cues and a lot of, I think, the the value of like this type of Hitchcockian movie is in those unspoken cues. Cause again, it is all about how well can you conform to the social order that's expected of you, you know? 
uh, and there are certain things that give it away or will hint at what you're doing. That's why the like chess games are so interesting in Hitchcocky movies. And there's lots of images that support that. It's like at the end of Notorious when Ingrid Bergman finally collapses from the poison. She's on a chessboard, giant tiled floor, right? She yeah. can interpret the moves they were making and the sinister intent they had in the teacup, you know? <sighs> But uh, but yes, so this we're going to talk more about this throughout the movie. But this, it's interesting how this movie not just accentuates the like theatrical technique and stage technique to enhance the parts of the play that work well, but how this movie in using this as a stage space then integrates that with like Hitchcockian ideas of like public versus private space. And I do, uh, I love this scene of just like him casually, like having small talk, like, oh, I don't like your friend's cooking. I'm just like, oh, you have another boyfriend? <laughs> and it's just like a yeah. cute, pedantic couple talk while like this guy's getting a feel for the apartment and just being like, okay, I need to do this murder now. It's it's a simple technique, obviously, but like it's done very effectively. And we've also like, seen like there's lots of clever meta statements too, where it's like, you know, Grace Kelly on the phone is talking about how like, oh, we loved every minute of the play. Yeah. It's like a little like we're watching a play, right? You know, like. Well, that's the thing I'm wondering in the original stage play, because normally when you do phone calls and stage play, you have to do the obnoxious thing where the character is just like, oh, you're really enjoying the play? Yeah. <laughs> because like, unless you like cut to a smaller section of the stage where like, that's where they're supposed to be on the other side of the phone. You can you have a spotlight on like a chair. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the char- That's the challenge of staging something in, on a See, stage. That's a positive change you can make if you're adapting a stage play to a movie. It's like you can have the audio over the phone. So you right. don't have to have a character talk like an imbecile. Well, you can consolidate it. Yes. But also that's not necessarily a problem. I'm sure there's plenty of clever ways to do that on a stage, you know? No, I'm not, I, I would never insult theater. Um, I, don't you dare no i just theater i i love theater i think it's an amazing performative art um i just think that there are good ways to adapt it to a different medium and bad ways which i think everybody would agree right and i, I mean think, every medium has its advantages yeah yeah and I, I think it's really interesting even though this movie gets written off i think because of that because this is kind of like a stage play and because of the 3d gimmick it gets dismissed actually in the Truffaut book, Hitchcock is like, well, we don't have to talk too much. Ab- Let me try that again. We don't have to talk too much about this one, do we? That's what he says. And it's yeah. like, really? <laughs> they And you know what? Even though Truffaut likes it, they only talk about it for two pages. It's Aww. like, what the fuck? Um, but it's like, this movie probably gets dismissed and neglected because of that. But if you think about it, it's not nearly the only stage play that he made. Think of Rope. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think it's even that. I think, I I don't know. And obviously, you've read the Truffaut book and you've read more about him. But like, if I had to get into like a director's mindset, if I had to like adapt a stage play and then mm-hmm. shoot it in glorious three D, and just like have it be sold as that gimmick, and then like it ended up not even being shown in that gimmick, like I I think I'd have a bad taste on my mouth after that. No matter like, well, also that he said this because another project fell. He he made this movie because another project fell through. Yeah. And he said, oh, I'll make this because it's safe. This is something that I know will do okay. That's a good way to put it, actually. This is a very safe Alfred Hitchcock movie. Like Maybe when he was making it, but if you look at what he actually did, it's it feels like very playful with the materials he was given. True, but like, I don't know. It, it seems like while the murder scheme is convoluted and relies on like, well, you did this and this is put there and that. that that's There's there. so many fucking objects. Yeah, like... I think this is a very safe Hitchcock movie. Like yeah. It's, it's not too shocking. It's not too, like, disturbing. But, like... Well, it, it then keep- again, it's so, like, chamber piece, you know? It's such a chamber piece movie that it's, like, there's only one moment of, like, where the camera really gets really expressionistic and it's, like, very dramatic, the attempted murder scene, right? But aside from that, it's all very just focused character interactions, you know? Yeah. So maybe that would be boring, but I don't know. I think this is just so much what I, I think Hitchcock's thinking was that this is so much what people would expect that he was just, this is just automatic. The difference between him and Tim Burton, <laughs> aside from the skill of the filmmaking, is that even. We all know Tim Burton's the better filmmaker. But- yes. 
Not even close. Yeah. Planet of the Apes? <laughs> I think Frank and Weenie just... Let's both. just say Planet of the Apes is a little bit better. There there ain't no Planet of the Birds. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Uh, but... But the interesting Alice thing about through the looking glass, it's not <laughs> Alice looking through the rear window. Come on, buddy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> get the fuck out of here. <laughs> it's a modern classic. Um, but yes. Anyway. Even, <laughs> even though Hitchcock is sort of making this on autopilot, it's still just an exercise for him, but he's like ironically better at doing the exercise. Yeah. You know? Well, I think it's just like, when you when you try to push yourself, like eventually, like there are going to be some things that you don't one hundred percent succeed in because you're not used to doing them. But when you just fall back on like default filmmaking mode, almost like this is almost like a math problem. Yeah, like with all these different objects being like the variables that he needs to handle with these characters to make it dramatic. But I'm saying like the structure is pretty simple. Yeah, for the most part, like so, like obviously it's going to be a, half it's going to be a solid movie because of that. Although it would be better if if this character was interesting whatsoever. Or, I mean, I don't even really like Grace Kelly's performance here. I think she's quite a bit better in, mm. in Rear Window. Well, yeah. Again, but that again. could also just be because I just don't like this character. She just does nothing. She has nothing to stop anything. I guess I'm going to death row now. Even Even her ability to save herself from her killer is something when he fucking yellow wallpapered the shit out of her right that those scissors were only out because he fucking he fucking had to convince her to be a like a lonely housewife and not go out how dare you go out i'm already going out with your boyfriend that'd be the real revenge yes they go to fuck island together there's some meme from some show i don't remember where it's just like well this is my boyfriend yeah, Mark, and this is his boyfriend, Chris. That okay. Would, that would be a good summary of this movie. This is my husband. <laughs> this is his boyfriend. Um, well, let me ask you something. Yes. Even though Grace Kelly is an object, it's maybe peculiar because she does not seem to me very much like a sexual object in this. No. The sexuality of our of Ray Milan's character is an interesting topic. And he seems so manipulative that it's almost like he seems like, like strangely asexual to me. It's not, it's not about that anymore. It's like a more of a wounded pride thing. I don't even know. It's a, well, it's a desire for money, obviously. And, but even when they were married, as we know, he wouldn't be near her, her, he would be playing tennis. Yeah. But like. But that's the thing. I think that like it was yet another object he acquired and then like this man stole it away from him. So it's just like, well, yeah, but it's not sexual. It's, it's not sexual. It's, it's a strange thing. Yeah. It's the object has been claimed by another. So like time to do away with it because it doesn't have any value anymore. It's like some where we- he's going to squeeze it like a sponge to get the value. Yeah, yeah. It's some weird masculine possession thing. Like it's it, it's definitely masculine. It's but it's not sexualized. Yeah. And a lot of that is uh, to a degree 50s thing. And sort of stage play type thing where it's just like... Well, also, that's part of Hitchcock's filmmaking as we're talking about it, right? How It's reliance on the presumption of a natural order, yeah. right? Very much ties it to its time, right? Where you can watch certain Hitchcock movies and you're supposed to be able to watch them and get details about a character by looking at a some sort of like trait or visible... Uh, a sort of tangible element about them that tells you something about who they are, right? Based on your assumptions of what that trait means. But when you are watching it 50, 60 years later, you can kind of get lost in the sauce with that. You know, you're like, I don't know what that means. Like, what does it mean that like, I bet on the tout. It was a phrase that yesterday. Well, we that's were, just like, well, that's just fifties jargon that hasn't translated. Well, but I mean, more specifically, I'm thinking of like strangers on a train with like the flamboyant shoes. Yeah. It's like, are people going to be able to tell those are flamboyant shoes? You know, He's dressing extravagantly for the time, but like now. you only know that now because he's got that lobster tie. Yes, and this is funny. The guy talking about the most boring and trivial shit possible. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and also I think it is funny. Um, uh, what's his name? I'm forgetting his name. Uh, the actor who plays Mark, 
This is a really cool shot too, by the way, just to interrupt myself. Very expressionistic, this shot. Um, once again, the curtains are this area that's very like the lighting dramatic this, visually. The lighting of the entire air, like that area in general, and the darkness is great. Uh, when the fireplace is rearing earlier, I think it's very good actually. Like, cause it's not like telegraphed. Like, yeah. And, yeah. And like, we have to remember that 54, this was the year that color film like became widely available to studios to use. Like before this, the majority of films were still in black and white. Um, I do believe this was only Hitchcock's second film in color. Yeah. Or no, I think it was his third, but yeah, it was his second or his third. 54 was the year that it became widely available. Um, actually the only reason I remember that off the top of my head is because, uh, them, which is one of my favorite 1950s horror movies was shot in black and white. And then halfway through production color film became available, which is why the title card for that movie is in color and everything else is in black and white. Just little things. Watch them. It's a fun time. We need to do that eventually. But, but yeah, so like I was saying, the boyfriend, I think in that moment is very funny. That's a huge giant fake thumb, by the way. Yes. That was a, <laughs> that was something they needed from the 3d because they couldn't focus it properly or they couldn't get a proper lens on it to get the shot they wanted. So they're like, fuck, we have to make a giant goddamn phone and a giant plastic thumb. Would you like to own that movie prop? Honestly, <laughs> I would try to get that giant prop and the giant ants from them. And yeah. then I would wage war against the giant <laughs> ant with this giant prop thumb, like yes. a sword. That's we, what I do. Where our favorite movie props can fight each other. Let's yeah. Make a movie about that. But yes, we also missed an interesting shot where we saw the internal mechanisms of the phone. And I think that's an interesting shot because this is like, that's truly the moment of no, like point of no return where we see Swan is about to leave up until that point. Right. But after that, it's too late. And it's interesting because it's very much like the fiction that they're authoring in their performances to one another on this stage, right. About murder, right. Yes. Setting up the remainder of the movie. It's like that fiction is now rendered tangible in reality and it cannot be reversed, right? And do you think this attack has like sexual undertones? Uh, I mean, to a degree. Just because of the, the fact of it and the way it's done? The positioning, obviously, yeah. yeah. And this um, makes me wonder about the 3D too, the way she's reaching out at the screen. Yeah. And the scissors. Because like, it, that it be? does have that depth. And this is very like cringy, like, ugh like death too, you know, the death with scissors. Well, yeah, he's like almost spasming because he got hit in the spine. It's just the way he falls. Yeah. And then, yeah, this is going to be, this is definitely like one of those good gore moments without any gore where it's like, Oh, you God. know, you know what happened? You didn't even need to see the scissors do that. You could yeah. have like seen him just fall on his back and you'd be just like, Oh, I know what happened. Yeah. Like, it's like, Oh God. And actually now that I'm thinking about it, I wonder if you could do some sort of, I don't know weird meta reading about that where it's like she's a woman using scissors to kill this but also scissors are an interesting prop in movies because they're like used for editing yeah. which is also mostly women i don't know hitchcock's a creative guy that's but what that, i'm saying but that's a that's kind of a post looking thing i don't i mean you there's lots of dramatic you can look at the way they light, light the curtains and maybe some meta thing about like curtains and the formal elements of curtains and like beginning and starting stories and like how that may like regulate space here's a more important like sort of uh basic question though is like how do we think he is performing when he's listening to this like it i think it's hard to tell how he exactly feels about his wife well i don't think he feels about his wife i think he feels like because even before he knows that it's gone wrong, he has some sort of like anguished look on his face. Is it just that he's nervous? Well, I think it was already that she picked up the phone initially. Mm -hmm. So like he doesn't know if he called too early and fucked the entire thing up. He doesn't know if Swan ducked out and like it's not going to happen at all. Like so he's already nervous that his perfectly planned murder isn't going to go right. I guess I assume that he thinks it's going to go right. And any like, I don't know, change on his face that you see while he's listening to the struggle is like something to do with his like sociopathology, I guess. Like, yeah, but we have, we're sociopathy. What's the word for that? Psychosis. I don't know. Point is he, he is, he is 
fucked <laughs> in the head. But also, like, it's hard to tell exactly to what extent he can relate to other people. Clearly he can, right? But but he, because he manipulates them so gracefully. Efficiently. Yeah. But it's there's still a disconnect there. And I think that disconnect is also related to, like, the asexuality that he seems to have in reference to his wife, right? Weirdly enough, would you say that's the original sin of this movie? Yeah, could be. Because um, I, I do want to just briefly talk about, like, what worse fate can you assign somebody to sit in a room of drunken old people <laughs> that they don't know? Talking about the proper place in which, what, what is he saying? Like, Dartmouth rather than Dartmoor <laughs> or something? Like, oh, God, yeah, like... That's that's a fate worse than death. He should have just taken his wife to the stag party. And just left her. Yes. No, that's exactly what he does not want to happen. I guess if she's yeah. too busy being talked to by all these people, she'll never have an opportunity to get married <laughs> and even them or change her will. That yeah, no, that that's absolutely terrible. But it is interesting if we're going to talk about the way this movie like plays with sympathies. Like it definitely arouses your sympathy against Grace Kelly, right? And in a certain sense, this movie like holds her responsible <laughs> for everything. But also, is she the original transgressor or is he the original transgressor by being too focused on his tennis? But that's the thing. We also find out like later that she was like, the affair was great, like, because of the fact, like it, it pre, almost predates the tennis thing to a degree. Like that was sort of just an excuse to get him out of the house. Like, yeah. No. What? No, they, she had the affair cause he was there in tennis and then he noticed and then he started changing. We, we get a little bit of more of an explanation later, but at the same, like nobody's completely guilty or completely innocent in this yeah. movie, but like, obviously like, <sighs> He's obviously the most at fault by far. Yes, and the movie agrees with that by the end. But yeah. but it is interesting still, like, because murder, even in this movie, is not the same as... And that's also the moment that dooms him, by the way. We'll talk about the object soon. But even in, in this movie, uh, this movie is not as harsh on Grace Kelly as to hold murder <laughs> as the same as her... Uh, Infidelity. Yeah, from her very neglectful and... Clearly to us at this point, like sociopathic husband, right? But also is, is his, again, is, is that like weirdly asexual relationship? Like, well, they have separate beds. So, well, this is still technically Hayes code. Yeah. But again, that still might make sense more in this situation because clearly there's a subtext there when she says he's focused on his tennis and not paying attention to me, right? Yeah. But then he stopped the tennis specifically for her. And yeah. That wasn't enough. And at the same time, I don't think it's like a coded homosexuality or anything no. like that. It's just, it. there's a lack of sexuality, you know, where there should be. And it is interesting to sort of divide this movie into two halves. Interestingly enough, in both halves, uh, Ray Milland is trying to spin a fiction for people to try to get them to buy it so that so that his wife will be killed. <laughs> the first time, it's just by Swan, and the second time, it's by the government. Yes. Right? If I can't get a sleazeball to do it, I'll have the government execute my wife. And I do think that's when he realizes it in that shot, too, when we get the close-up of him being like, who did it? And he's like, just come this way, officer. Now, Max, I'd like to ask you. Yes. If you were going to kill your wife. Okay. I'm getting there. Let, let's go. Well, would you do do it the way Ray Milan did it? Do you have feedback? <sighs> okay. So, keep it simple, stupid. Um, like, there are way too many variab variables here. In an age before cell phones, for you, like, there were, like, four times before he left for the stag party that everything could have fallen through. And yes, he like, Oh, I'm a master manipulator. I made it work anyway. But like, if you have no way in getting of getting in contact with 
the guy who's going to be murdering him, don't just be like, oh, I'm going to leave forever. Like, I'm going to leave and if my wife decides to go out, if the fucking landlord of whatever apartment complex they live in is just like, oh, can you come up and pay rent? There's so many reasons everything could have gone wrong. Don't don't plan on that. There's too many objects. You're You're giving him a key to the apartment in that place that could have gotten, like, kicked out when somebody steps on it and lost forever like yeah well that's nitpicking it's not it? it's not nitpicking it's saying that there are way too many variables for this to go wrong and you should have kept it simpler that's all i'm saying i still haven't heard how you're going to do it well you said do i have feedback for him okay you didn't ask i guess how that's how a starting point yeah that's a starting point how would you kill your wife am i in the 50s you mean in your 50s? No, am I in the 50s? Like, am I in the same timeline <laughs> as these people? I'm going to say you're in an alternate steampunk 50s. That, oh God. <laughs> <sighs> I used to love steampunk stuff. Steampunk, like, world building and whatnot. I just... And then what did you just like? Enough with the steam. It's just like, nobody ever does things, a fun thing with a premise, I guess. Or is it just like too easy to stick like clockwork gears on something? Yeah, basically. It's, it's my steampunk dog. It's never like, there's never like a reason for why anything. It's like space way. things. Like in Star or, uh, Starship Troopers, the space football. <laughs> yeah. Well, not even that, but like, there's no reason that you make those characters a world steampunk other than it looks cool. Like, I don't know. I If there's like a reason why society never progressed past like victorian era technology and aesthetic then go for it but if you're just gonna do it just that's a really shitty thing is because if they also have not progressed past victorian era sexuality they can't even use the steampunk technology for sex toys yeah unfortunately that's the real shame of it yeah my my coal powered dildo (laughs) you don't want to leave it on for too long it gets very hot (laughs) Oh, man, we got to go patent that. <laughs> anyway. Let me, let me just give... Let me contaminate this crime scene with this gigantic fucking trailer. Well, they're of, British, Max. What do you expect? Tea, but I figure, like, that's a police issue thing where you just carry that around in your little police bag. <laughs> they have a little tea packet yeah. for, like, emergencies? Yes. Yeah. Well... That's another interesting thing. It's a very big overhead shot. We can talk about it during this intermission here. Um, yeah. By the way, we're not, we're not going to pause for the intermission. So you, you can, can pause if through. you want. You really shouldn't. It's again, You should not do that. Okay, um, the intermission's over, though. It's about advisable. It's interrupting me, Max. So very advisable. Anyway, uh, and we'll get to the back to this public gathering outside the house as well. <laughs> but interesting thing with that shot that we didn't even mention during the murder scene is how many of the shots are repeated throughout the movie. And I think it's interesting how the movie sets up all its shots for the murder scene and sequence beforehand. I think it's a good way to like cue your audience for like what part of the murder plot they're at, you know, and like how far along in the plan they are and whether or not it's going correctly. And definitely when the murder starts to happen, it goes wrong. It's definitely very yeah. visually different from what you were expecting based on the earlier information given to you. And I think the same thing happens too after the murder fails and the police arrive, we get that same overhead shot that then focuses in on the T, right? And I think it is interesting how, again, we mentioned how we're going to talk about the difference between public and private space in this movie and how this movie really mixes those two things, right? Yeah. And uh, how they're mixed from the beginning, but it just becomes more and more convoluted, the line separating those two things as the movie goes on. And definitely, definitely when the police come in here, this entire room becomes much less of a private space. No, it's much more, everything is suspect in the room. Everything is no longer, I don't know, safe. I yeah. Guess. And it's the same thing we're talking about is all these images now are laden with potential meaning. Yeah. Right. They're potentially clues in a crime and it makes everything as simple as like a key or stockings to be like the linchpin in some like sinister. And we see that act. we see that with his character actions of him disrupting the privateness of it with him just throwing his hat on the canes and throwing his coat haphazardly on a chair. Like, yep. 
like he lives there, like it's his place already. That's why the title inspector is so appropriate for a Hitchcock yeah. movie, right? Cause he's just going to inspect everything and go over every object and probe it for that sinister meaning. If he can find it. And I do, f- uh, this actor's name is John Williams. I think his performance is really delightful. Yeah. I mean, he's a cheesy, fun British inspector. I yeah. like it, but, but also he does feel intimidating. In a certain extent, I think you he, know. I think it's less him that feels intimidating and more the authority behind him that it represents. Like, but I do think he plays it well. He's affable, but I think he maintains like an air of officiality that never lets you forget that he's actually just a cop underneath this, right? Yeah. Where the cop in Psycho just looks scary, right? Because he's got those glasses and his face looks like a giant fucking skull, right? <laughs> Whereas in this, it's like, oh, it's just an aff- affable British chap, right? Oh, oh I was stopping my way by, just look, I am going like he, to get some tea. He does look like he belongs in a Monty Python sketch. Like, he does. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he even uses some funny British phrases later on. But uh, but I think he he still manages to play that authority, definitely. And it is interesting how the like mixing of of public and private space is something that interacts with this being like a very stagey movie and the way stage works in the first place. Yeah. Well, and we have that visually shown with like the inspector opening up the curtains as well. It's just opening up this private area. Yeah. Um, and then we have a, almost a visual call, direct visual callback to him and Swan. Yeah. In the same exact place. Well, it's the repetition of the same thing. Yeah. We're not yet selling the inspector on the murder of his wife yet, but we're going to get there eventually, right? Um, and it, it, it's similar how that's repeated multiple times, where it's like, oh, they start talking about one thing, and then it leads into a more openly sinister thing, right? Yeah. Um, Because again, there's always like some sort of stain or some sort of thread that you can pull on, and then it starts unraveling the whole sweater, Right. But it is interesting how, you know, the staginess and and stuff like that affects the public and private space and how like even when you're acting in theater, it doesn't even have to be a movie. Right. Yeah. You have intimate moments between two performers on a on a stage. Right. But they're still acting, you know, and it could be an intimate private moment, but you, there's still a sense of it being a performance because it's theater, right? Well, also, we we established in this moment you were talking about how the inspector does have like some authority and yeah presence behind him, right? I think that's a great moment where it subtly establishes that he can already walk circles around the wife in terms of wit, where he's just like fooling her with the photo yeah, thing immediately. Right. And then we have to have the husband step in and just be like, listen, no, this is the narrative we're going back. And then it becomes, even though he's still technically questioning her, it becomes a battle of wits between them. And even visually too, it's like the wife has no objects. Yeah. Where he immediately goes off and gets the same uh, like picture from the wall, right? Ray Milland is the one who is in control of the objects that legitimate his fiction of the events that's happening, right? Whereas Grace Kelly has no fucking clue what's going on. She's not aware of any objects or what yeah. means this or that. She's just fucking clueless. And she just holds on to her husband's arm. I'm just a woman. Do I have to live through this? But yeah. Anyways, the, the point I was just making is that the fact that this is like adapted from a stage play and feels so stagey is something that is interesting when it interacts with the mixing of the public and private space. Because weirdly, this is never truly a... We never really see this as a private space. The first time we see into this space is like her talking with like the person she's having an affair with. Yeah. You know? And again, we, we see that it's not really a private space when he says things like, Oh, it's going to be brutal. We're just going to be saying nice things to each other. Right. Yeah. That's the public space paradigm in the private space. You're supposed to be able to be quote unquote naked, right? You don't have to put the mask up, but in this, you still have to. And it's interesting how, how like, over the course of this movie, it's not just the mask about the murder, but it's like everybody, there's layers of masks that people have to perform for, you know? Definitely. And that's also part of the cleverness that Ray Milan uses to implicate Grace Kelly throughout this, is that what he's able to do partially is, um, and, and even before this, by planting the letter on Swan's body, he's able to make it very hard for her to sport her mask of infidelity which is not the crime 
They're investigating, right? But it also casts doubt on her. Right. And it's going to lead her to lie about certain objects and details to this inspector, right? Now, the real question of this movie... Well, it makes the inspector more distrustful of the wife where that hadn't been found on Swan's body. One, you'd probably be slightly more sympathetic to the woman who was attacked. And two, you might be suspicious that the husband was already calling her in the middle of her getting attacked by this guy. Right. It's all about the placement of the objects. Yes. And that's a good moment to sort of segue into discussing that second type of Hitchcockian object that we mentioned earlier that is not a MacGuffin, but is still something that motivates character behavior and more importantly, changes character behavior. Um, And when I say change, I mean characters change when they interact with these objects, right? And the idea is that these objects cause drama to occur because of their context, right? Um, they're not things that have a lack of specificity like MacGuffin, where MacGuffin is like, the famous joke about it is like, you know, a, what is a MacGuffin? It's like, no, it's nothing, right? Yeah. I can't even remember the fucking joke. It's a stupid British joke about how a MacGuffin is pointless. But the only point of it, it's like a, a vanishing point on the horizon. It gives people something to move towards, but it doesn't matter if they actually get there because it's just another thing. It's they're an object that... It- it doesn't serve a purpose other than to move the plot forward. Yes, like, yes. Whereas the second Hitchcockian object can also move the plot forward, but it's something that very much changes character dynamics. And it's because of the, the object's context. I'll quote some passages that articulate this very clearly from the essay from uh, the book Everything You Wanted to Know About Lacan, but we're afraid to ask Hitchcock. But it's a great sort of summary of this type of object where the context is everything, right? Again, it's it's not the fact of the letter itself. It's the fact that it's on Swan, yes. right? Where it is, right? Or it's not the fact of where her key is. Or, or no, it's not the fact of her key itself. It's does she have it or does she not have it? Or does Swan have it, you or know? whose key was it actually there? Yes. Um, just to... I'm sure if you've made it this far into the podcast, you're fairly familiar with uh, film terms and examples of modern MacGuffins, but I think the two that are most, in case you're not, um, the two most obvious ones in modern cinema that like just make me roll my eyes back into my head of just how useless they are. Mystery Glove. What's it called from Avengers? That's what I'm saying. The Tesseract. Oh, yeah. The Tesseract, well, the Tesseract from the original Avengers, which turns out to be a part of the Mystery Glove or all call. of them. What's yeah. it called? The Infinity Stones. Okay. The Infinity Stones. No, but what's the hand socket? Infinity Gauntlet. Oh, it's just called that. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think Mystery Glove is better. <laughs> but, and also in uh, Avatar Unobtainium, which is one, the stupidest name for a thing ever, but two. Well, that's a joke name. That's ironic in that. That's some, that you can ding that movie for other things. That's a joke I, name. I can, but like the fact that the movie doesn't dwell on it makes me think it's just lazy writing. But no, it's that the people in the movie also read science fiction, which has, they t- termed yeah. it unobtainium because it's the magical MacGuffin that people have to get. Yes. Um, even though I think unobtainium is more specific in that movie, it's definitely. Well, we don't, we, thing. we don't know what it does. Like it's, well, just, it has no purpose. Yeah. It's the non-specificity of it. Yes. Um, but, uh, but you're can right. We, can we never do Avatar? Like that's a movie I hate and love to tear down, but I would never want to do a, uh, we have to keep going until Avatar 2 comes out. Oh, God. <laughs> which means we'll be doing this for the next 15 years. I'm sorry. No, Avatar 2 is, I think, slated for a 2022 release at the moment. Yeah, they pushed it back again. Yeah, but now it has like the definitive date, and I'm just like... Uh... Is, is James Cameron a liberal? Is he horrified by what's happening? Can he find better ways to spend no. his money? James Cameron actually likes the ocean, so he can't wait for it to encompass all of the, <laughs> the earth so he can finally return to it. <laughs> Just waiting to return to the water. He's yes. like one of the people from an HP Lovecraft story. Yes. Like squid tentacle man <laughs> from the water. <laughs> oh, Jesus, James. Anyway, sorry. But I just, yes, I just pictured James Cameron as a uh, fucking Davy Jones from the Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, here's some interesting framing. Uh, 
We were talking about this, and this is a very, very interesting shot because I think this is definitely the moment the the inspector starts to really be suspicious of Raymond Land. We see it; you can see them organized almost as if they're each seat, sitting on one side of a table, right, yes. a four side table. And if you look at the way each character is paired along different axes, right, at the first part of the shot, we have Mark and Grace Kelly paired along the X axis, and then the inspector and Raymond Land along right the here. Z axis, yes. right, and then it shifts. So that then Ray Maland and the inspector are on the x-axis. And I think it's very interesting because when you have the characters that are in depth, Ray Maland and the in- inspector at the beginning, it seems very much like they're intruding on the natural coupling. Of the marriage? Yes. Of and the Well, not the marriage, but the quote-unquote union. Yes. Right? Of that, the healthy union. And then the switch, you have the infidelity boyfriend and you have the inspector or you have the wife. Yes, who are then intruding on intruding the, on the inspector getting to the true guilty party, right? And we, we're I'm not entirely sure exactly what sort of character or argumentative logic that camera movement is tracking with, right? Yeah. But I think it is something about the spectator, uh, sort of, I guess, changing the spectator. The, Inspector, whatever. Yeah, I'm sorry. fucking up that word. The inspector is realizing something new about the situation in that moment. And because we get that shift where the inspector and Ray Milland are both on the X axis at the end, it's definitely like, oh, he's on to him in a new way that he wasn't beforehand. And he won't give it away in his social cues, but yeah. it's definitely there. The camera will tell us, even if he won't. And uh, it's interesting, too, that he asks Ray Milland to open the win- like windows because there's public outside. He's asking Ray Milland to create privacy and in doing so creates privacy for them to talk about the real facts he wants to yeah. get at, which is interesting. And again, it is, it is interesting too, how we didn't mention this as it was happening. Cause we were talking about Davy Jones bearded James Cameron, but uh, you know, Grace Kelly earlier does say to the inspector's face, she lies on the basis of the infidelity, right? Which, yeah. Instead of the murder. Of course, in this case, because the things are so closely intertwined, it seems that she's lying about the murder. Of course, one thing I started to say earlier but never really finished is that this movie kind of cheats. And the reason being uh, is that this inspector arrives and we get that interesting camera moment and then the confession that he knows more than he's letting on, right? About these two characters because the, the letter they found, right? And he sends Ray out of the room. Well, the really interesting thing about this is that he's now going to very much lay the burden of guilt upon Grace Kelly in front of Ray Milland, right? But we don't know the degree to which he's doing this for show because he actually suspects Ray Milland or if he actually thinks Grace Kelly is guilty here. If, if he actually suspects Ray Milland and this is just the long game, one great job at fourth dimensional chess playing of I'm going to get this guy's a day away from execution so that I can come up with the perfect convoluted. There scenario. are better ways to do yeah. this inspector, <laughs> yes. but as we know, he does not give a fuck about regulations. Yes. In fact, is he even a real police officer? No, he just showed up in a bow tie with a mustache. One yes. day, And they're just like, Oh, look at him. He can't not be an inspector. Yeah. It's the importance of those eyebrows and mustache. Yeah. And again, that's the real thing, Max, is the sinister subterranean meaning behind this. He's not an inspector at all. He's just an old man who's crazy. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. Oh, poor Grace Kelly. The one time she does offer an object to try to legitimate her story. It's Uh, a false object. Well, it's not even that. It's that she just incriminates herself. <laughs> yeah. It's like, the, no, the fact that you're offering the key now just makes you look guilty. Of course, the other interesting thing about this is, you know, part of that camera move and part of why I think this is really a transition point for him suspecting Ray Milland and why it makes you wonder if he actually thinks Grace Kelly is guilty is because clearly this inspector can recognize the quote unquote true couple here. You know what I mean? He recognizes that one coupling is invalid and that the other is valid. You know what I'm saying? And I think it goes back to that interesting shot that we see, right? Where he, he's sort of, he and Ray Milan seem like they're inner, they're like intercedence in the interaction between Grace Kelly and Mark. 
but then it shifts, right? So once he has sort of has an understanding of the valid couple in this room, the dynamic changes, and then suddenly he manipulates Ray Milland. Even if he is doing so that he, he can confront them, Ray Milland is the one he manipulated. Ray yeah. Milland is the one he asked to go outside, right? He lied to Ray Milland. He didn't lie to them. Well, I think also, like, he... Yeah, no, he was straightforward with them. But also, like... As we see, yeah, we we saw before, he wasn't getting anywhere with her as long as he was in the picture because he kept just twisting it back to the same story. Right, right. So also getting him out of there gives him an opportunity to run mental circles around this poor woman. Unfortunately, yeah. I do like his like little like proprietor like propriety mm-hmm. things where it's like, oh, I was just I was just wondering. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't quite get the significance of this. Was it that he's prissy? He has to make the carpet perfect. I don't know. I I think it's control just to make, freak. Make sure the blood stain stays covered up. Properly. I guess so. And then I think this is an interesting creative sequence. It does remind me a lot of uh, the sort of I don't want to call it a camera address, but when Janet Lee is looking right into the camera when she's driving in Psycho, it seems very similar. No, right? I, lo- I Except like... Except in the- that she's passing judgment on herself. Yeah, I like the lighting, but, like... And I guess this, this does work in the whole, like... One, I can clearly tell this is a stage play, and you do, like, different lights coming from different things. Yeah, it's a way to do this without, like, being, like, going to the courthouse. Yeah. Um, you don't have to leave the area. But... Something Hitchcock talks about, too, in the book. At the same time, since it doesn't seem like a whole lot of time has passed after this is done, because it almost looks like the day after, it looks like the legal process is just terrifying in this weird alternate 1950s And why England. are they putting a blanket on his head? Eng- Seriously, I don't understand this. England has a lot of fucking weird things. They still wear the curly wigs in there. Because this courts. is like a dream sequence thing to begin with. Not yeah. a dream sequence, but it's very abstract. And yeah. then you just cut to this crusty old man and they put a blanket on his head. <laughs> I'm like, why? <laughs> what does that mean? This is Davis, David Lynch's earliest film. Um, no, but what does that mean? In the, I'm assuming that's something that happens in the court system. That may be. But why? Maybe the black thing is like to represent execution or whatever. I don't know. Maybe there's some significance that. Has... No, it has to be a thing that happens in the real world. Otherwise, no, it's no just... I'm saying like. Maybe that's like the verdict. Like if you get a guilty verdict and like it's going to lead to the death penalty, you do that. I don't know. England has a bunch of weird traditions. So they put a blanket on the judge's head? Yes, of course. He's already wearing a wig and now he's got a blanket on his head. Yes. It's got to be really hot under that wig. <laughs> Why do you think the British are always so grumpy? Because their teeth are fucked up. <laughs> yeah. How long does he think he has to wear the blanket? Well, yeah, for? it's because they drink so much tea because they're dehydrated from wearing the wigs <laughs> and the blankets on their head. It all makes sense now. Oh, my God. It does. Seriously, if anybody knows what the fuck that's about, please. I've never been more curious about like, something. Co- like, comment, and subscribe. About no, it. don't even do that. Just fucking tell us. Yeah. What is the Just deal with comment. that? But yes, one thing I haven't mentioned too is how this movie is very much, um, even though it's adapted from the play. It's very much Hitchcock riffing on a movie that he's already done, which is also a really fantastic movie. Better oh, yeah, than this one, I'd say. This. Yeah, it's a movie called Blackmail. It's the last movie he did um, as a silent movie. And uh, it's really kinetic and awesome, except in that one, it's very straightforward. A woman is posing as a model, I believe, for some vagabond, and uh, he gets lascivious and attacks her, but he she kills him in self-defense, Right. But then somebody figures out about it and starts blackmailing her and her boyfriend, her fiance. Yeah. Boyfriends didn't exist because that's improper. Uh, but her and her fiance, her, if it's fiance, it's like, okay. Right. Um, so then the entire movie is this adventure of them having to actually overcome this evil blackmailer. But in this, it's even more interesting, right? Because it's like, you're taking the sinister, meaning story that's originally happening and unfolding in front of your eyes. Right. And then it's saying, no, what you're seeing is literally not the truth of what's happening. It's saying, imagine if the blackmailer was the, the, the fiance the whole time. Dun, dun, dun. You know what I mean? That's why this movie is more about like the fiction of these images than that, because with that, you're at least seeing it happen in real time and you have a concrete basis in reality. Whereas with this, it's like in this room, 
these people, if they're clever enough, can come up with any story for anything, you know? Yeah. These people can have any name they want, right? If they're clever enough to solidify that. Unfortunately, Swan was not clever enough to do that. But that's why this is an interesting like stage area because people, this is where they create fiction and perform for one another. And it's why it's definitely not a private space. But at any rate, Blackmail is a really good movie. We could probably do that one at some point. Yeah, why not? It definitely feels very um, Soviet, that movie, in terms of the way the editing strategy happens. And it's interesting because I feel like Hitchcock is not somebody who very frequently is like taking overt influence from other directors. He does at certain points in his career, but I think for the most part, he's very like solidly uh, focused on only developing his own ideas. And when he takes things from other filmmakers, it's usually on a more like subterranean, less noticeable level. The, the only problem I have with this, like, like this is the payoff for him being a crime writer before as he figures out almost to detail how Tony actually did it. But also it's kind of a, like, can you imagine if you were in this situation, if like your wife is on death row and you found out she's been cheating on you and I'm, I'm just assuming like, let's say he didn't do any of this and your wife's boyfriend comes up to you and it's like, dude, no, I figured out a way to save your wife. You're going to jail. <laughs> you plead guilty instead. It's right. perfect. I'd be like, get the fuck out of my house. Why don't you do this? And that's certainly the weird yeah. thing. Cause he, he, despite being the master social manipulator that he is, yeah. he does not realize that unlike Swan at the beginning, who, since he is innocent could say if, if he was innocent would say, I'm fucking leaving. Fuck yeah. you. Right. He has no reason to be like, putting up with any of this. Yeah. You know what I mean? He Get could out say, of my house. Yeah, he could say, fuck you. Because yeah. as far as Mark is concerned, there's nothing that exists that could actually legitimate this story. But it is it is interesting when you say, like, you use the phrase figuring it out, but it's, the the whole interesting thing about this is, like, it's less figuring out than it is, like, creating you know yeah. he happened to simultaneously create not simultaneously but independently create the same fiction that ray Milland did only ray Milland was not able to manifest his like plan in reality right um of course he's going to figure out that it is the case right once he finds the money a suitcase full of money right which is kind of dumb the fact that he would do that what do you mean just carry around all of the money he was going to use to pay Swan. And well, sales. put it on your bed. Yeah. Like, I understand having it in your house, even though you've got this guy, you know, creeping around. Right. But are you really going to just leave it on your bed? Yeah. Just throw it under there real quick. At the very least, the very, very least. Yeah. I mean, Jesus, weren't you a kid who had to hide like condoms from your parents or something? Just sweep it under the bed. It's easy. I actually never had to do that. Um, I went to a weird hippie church that had a super in-depth sex, yeah, sex education program. So they made us go into convenience stores when we were in eighth grade and buy condoms. Because <laughs> they fucking made you do that. Yeah. That was homework for that. Um, I see. I were, I can speak for both of us when I say that we are all for more sex education. Yeah. But also like they made you buy condoms. <laughs> Well, yeah, just like it was more of a exercise to prove to you that you're not going to catch on fire by going into a store to buy them. Not, yeah. And also that stores can't deny because there's no age restrictions on buying condoms. So ah, that's a good lesson. So if you're in eighth grade, you can go into a CVS and buy them. You might get a weird look from the clerk, but you're still allowed to do it. Well, that's a very Hitchcockian moment. Yes. <laughs> nobody wants to be the person buying condoms at CVS. No, nobody wants to be the one selling them to an eighth grader, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you'd rather be that person than the eighth grader themselves. Uh, having been on both ends of that equation, I'm not entirely sure, but it's both a terrible situation. But yes, so we're back to the, we're back to the mental gymnastics of them trying to outwit each other constantly, even though the inspector is yet again playing fourth dimensional chess and already has everything figured out. 
Right. Well, this is this is the cheating that this inspector does is that he does things off screen. Yeah. That's why it's cheating and why I feel slightly cheated by this movie. And again, playing with objects. The inspector is smart enough to introduce a false object to trick him, right? Yeah. So he has an excuse to do this. And that's why the inspector is the sort of the equivalent of of uh, Ray Milland here. And, you know, it's an interesting sort of add on to the idea of the tennis metaphor of like a social game or social interaction and having, having it be this idea of two people hitting an object back and forth. Right. Um, and having that be something that Ray Milland is good at related to like the tennis metaphor. Yeah. He's good at crafting these fictions by manipulating them around objects and using that to legitimate or legitimize what he's saying and the the inspector is as well only he has to be slightly more clever than it about that than Raymond land because he doesn't want Raymond land to get wise to what he's doing. But speaking of objects, Raymond land has just fucked himself because, well, I guess, no, it doesn't really matter what Raymond land does here. And that's the other way this movie is cheating. We get this big reveal here, right, where Mark realizes there's a giant suitcase full of cash that incriminates Ray Milland here. Yeah. But it doesn't ultimately amount to something because we know after we've watched the movie that regardless of what happens here, the inspector has gotten what he came came for. Yeah, Ray could have gone home. Like, his presence doesn't matter in the film anymore. Oh, you mean Mark? Mark, yes. Like, he could have gone home. But it's it's like literally... No matter what they said, it doesn't matter because the moment the inspector realizes that that key does not actually fit the lock, it, Ray Milan's fucked. Yes. Ray Milan no longer has any escape route. We as the audience and Ray Milan don't truly realize this yet. But the inspector does. And like yes. the fact that he's playing these games still and that we have to have this scene of him just being like... Now, I know there are other things he has to like substantiate, but it's like... At this point, in retrospect, you're like, oh, the movie's actually over now. Yeah. Because the inspector has got him. And I guess in a certain sense, it's interesting because it's like you just you're learning the layers of the game that's going on. But also you do feel kind of cheated because it's like there's no actual drama going on here. It's just drama for the characters, for some of the characters. Right. And I think that is that does have to do with part of the reason why this this half of the movie is a little bit less exciting because the first half has this really great social game going on, but it's also like, it is a legitimate question of will they or won't they be able to pull it off? Right. Or what will happen? Will he agree? We don't know for a fact that he will agree. Right. Whereas here we're investigating the past, which is like a static image. You know, you can't change the past. You can't change what happened static. Right. Yeah. So it's only a question of will they or won't they find out, you know, it's not a question of what will happen as a result of this. So it is a little bit less exciting, but I do still really enjoy these character interactions, mostly between Ray Milland and, uh, and John Williams here. I think this is like a high point of Ray Milland's career. It is great. He's been in a number of really good movies, but but uh, you know s- stuff like this it really stands out to me. I guess one of the interesting things, though, if we're going to comment on his performance, is that this movie really gives him an opportunity for that performance. Yeah, I was saying that before that, like by far, he has the most time in the script to shine with his performance. And if we're comparing, like like we said, there's five characters. Yeah. In this movie. Only him and the inspector are really ever given time to shine in this. The other ones are sort of tertiary characters, even though they're supposed they're central to the plot. Yeah, they are. It's weird because they are central to the plot, but they do. And these other two characters do end up seeming like they're relegated to that tennis ball position. Yes. They're not the players. They're just the object that's being batted back and forth between them. They're just as important as the keys or the letter or whatnot. They're not necessarily characters. They're just more pieces in the puzzle of this game that the inspector and our main character are playing back and forth. And I guess that is an overall weakness of this movie as well, where the one thing that, that gets into like having sort of a multiplication of the stakes for other characters is the thing with the infidelity. And now that's broken and gone. Yeah. And that's only one thing. 
<laughs> also, this is illegal. He's really handsy. Yeah, well, yes. Okay, we, we've been teasing at it this entire movie, but this police officer certainly does not behave like a police officer. I don't know what the rules are in the UK, and specifically the UK in 1954. Yes, we're not familiar with that legal jurisdiction. Well, not yet. Us in America are headed in that direction <laughs> pretty quickly. Just see, wait. You know what? They wouldn't even put in this much fucking effort. They just shoot you. They just break down the door and shoot everybody. And now it's over. Now there's no more questions, is there? But anyway, yeah, what we're trying to get at is he just literally walks in up to his desk and get his checkbook without just being like, oh, I have a warrant for this because of that. Yes, he opens his his desk and looks through his bank statements. And then also we learn later that he breaks into his apartment multiple times. Yeah. So what? So that's not okay, right? And, um, you know, that would be a nitpick, except for the fact that there's so much snooping and then weird, like, underhanded police activity that results in Ray Milland getting caught anyway. And then you look at that nitpick detail of this, right? Yeah. Just in this scene again, you're like, that's just part of a general pattern where they they break laws. Of course, you could also say that's like a sneaky, like cynical thing going on here where it's like the only way he could be caught is if they broke laws in the first place. Yeah. That's not, that's also another thing he didn't, he thinks he's so clever. He took everything yes. into account. But he, he didn't, didn't take into account. They did just fucking break the rules. Yes. They're not playing the game by the rules that he set it up in. So. Yes. Well, they set up the rules they and then the they rule. broke it. Yes. Yet again, the inspector's playing fourth dimensional chess with this whole thing. So we'll get to see that. In yes. The- and by that, it's just slamming the chessboard on the ground <laughs> yes. and saying, I won. Your queen broke in half. So therefore I won. Yeah. So it's weird. And I guess that that could play into like a little underhanded sort of jab at the police. Because as we know, Hitchcock is not a fan of the police. Uh, and he is not a fan of the type of authority that they represent. Hashtag ACAB. But what? Yeah. A cap, don't worry about it. Um, okay. But yes, we, we we think we're finally done of this, done with that character for the rest of the movie. At least we are hoping. I was hoping. Right. Well, of course, the other disadvantage, like we were saying, of the performances, by the way, and just these characters, is when we're talking about the stakes. Ray Milland is the only one with something at stake here. Yeah. Like and the- like we were saying, you know, Grace Kelly kind of has something at stake earlier with the infidelity, but it's dissolved fairly quickly. And yeah, it it is the reason that the jury didn't believe her for anything, but at the same time, like it's, yeah, it's thrown away immediately after well, that. Even that is sort of something that happens off screen. And also, right? Yeah. And also like this whole thing, this is just convoluted. This is convoluted, but this besides- is basically like Lemillion. What just happened? <laughs> What I want to talk about. I got a lottery ticket in that. I feel less anxiety watching this movie. Um, (laughs) But the thing about this is because we spend the most time with this character, we almost want to see his, like him get away with it to a degree. Right. Like that's the entire focus. We've been with him the entire movie. But also he's the only one with something to get away with. Yeah. You know, I don't give a fuck about the inspector. I don't care about, infidelity couple to a, like a degree like i don't want like it's a weird complicated thing that yeah been, that because could... he's the only one with clearly something that he wants yes whereas the inspector is just doing his job and then the couple they just they don't know what they want that's yeah. the whole fucking we, point they we, don't know if they want to be together or whatever and we don't know what they want by extension as well yes like, because they're not on screen and yes. it doesn't matter <sighs> i think that is an inherent weakness built into this premise that that does sort of harm a little bit of the uh, character dynamics in the second half, because in the second half, none of these scenarios are quite as strong as like the scenario of inviting somebody over and then revealing that it's a mousetrap, you know, and that you now are obligated to perform murder to weirdly enough, avoid being like convicted of murder. (laughs) Right. Don't know. And we'll just see him break the law again. It's fine. Well, his blood was up. Yes. As we'll, we'll see later. And, and you and I made a what? lot of funny jokes about how that might be something about erectile dysfunction. <laughs> Don't drag me into this with you. <laughs> well, we were saying, like, it's like Edgar G. Robinson in Double Indemnity, 
where he's the insurance investigator. And he's like, I can always tell when somebody's trying to scam us because I got this like feeling in my gut, right? <laughs> and with this guy, his blood is up. When he gets hard, he knows something is up other than his penis. Uh, 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 uh. Austin, you get, yeah, this is blatantly illegal though. Yeah. Also, what? if this is going to be a crime scene again for when they arrest him on this, like he's also yet again contaminating evidence. Yeah. Well, I mean, just the fact of that, okay, you caught him. You can now no longer use any of this evidence now guaranteeing that he will get away scot-free, even though he won't have the money. Yeah. You cannot arrest him because you broke the law, unless the law works differently in the UK in 1954. And even if he does, like... Maybe he does work differently. I don't know. The He said that, like, oh, well, listen, if you get convicted for this, you only serve, like, two or three years in prison. It's not like he's going away for life. Yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, you can always point these, poke these holes in a lot of Hitchcock's movies, right? Well, this is the this is the problem. The reason we're spending time to poke holes now is, like I said, the second act yeah. kind of drags a little bit, and it is definitely becoming a, a sort of casualty of something we've talked about in the past um, in terms of movies having problems with plotting, yeah. specifically Bird Box and the terms we used, the terms we appropriated from like linguistic studies to sort of uh, better tackle these questions of how, why it works or why it doesn't work are the terms synchronic and diachronic, right? Oh yeah. And just to give a little refresh, synchronic means something sort of, uh, at the moment and diachronic is more like an objective, like detached, more historical perspective. If we're just going to use these terms for this scenario, right? Um, here's an example. Us in the moment right now, synchronic. But if we listen to this episode again, we're going to have a diachronic perspective on that because yeah. it's historical right there's a detachment there audiences experience movies usually more diachronically right but this movie is almost happening in real time a lot of it so we're stuck into one location at one time right so it's sort of like a synchronic experience for us you know what i mean yeah so when you get moments like this where the audience because of information we have already already understands what's going to happen or the outcome of this specific scene. It's no longer dramatic because we're just watching it happen. You know, we're just watching it play out. We're watching this thing go from A to Z, but we know 100% what the destination is. And more importantly, we know how it's going to get there, right? It's not as simple as like knowing the destination ruins the scene that's happening. No, but like, but we know they're about to put the, the clues together, right? And there's no room for something to surprise us. Yeah. It's like, that is a very Hitchcockian thing. And like, if it wasn't so obvious, I think a different way you could take this movie would be like, you have it. So at like you, you don't know he's planning anything. Right. And then you, you make use of your crime author character Right. And you have him slowly piece the pieces together after she's already been in prison and it's too late to do anything. But or like, she's been executed. Yes. Yeah. Like, and then it becomes a real, like, out for blood yes. sort of thing. Well, that would be interesting because now he has skin in the game. You yeah. know what I mean? And right now they really, I know, even though she's fighting for her life, it seems like she's just not involved with anything. You know, she, she's defeated at this point. Look at her. Like, she's just an object. Yeah. And we get to the ultimate expression of this where she's like, no, I don't know that key. Your husband's explained this, you know, you can tell us all about it. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. No, of course you don't know what we're talking about. Now we're going to put your husband away for two years. <laughs> <laughs> After we were going to murder you based on shoddy evidence, it's fine. Maybe they'll break the loss again there and they'll just throw him away forever. Yeah. They'll execute him for, and it's like, Oh, we lost the latch key or it's like, it's not fitting. So just like your own latch key. Cause like what they would charge him for what conspiracy to commit murder and obstruction of justice. Like, I guess so. That's not, you're not going away for life for most of that. But anyway, look at her. I feel bad that we didn't get, more of a time of performance from her. She does start to show some emotional range in these scenes because she's allowed to be. But Although weirdly enough, she's saying like, I don't feel anything. Yes, but then like 
she does have a breakdown later and then like she does like start to show emotion, but that's the, that's her only moment this entire film. You think that she like, they could have given her a little more during the like entire initial interrogation scene, but at the same time, like you'd think that that would the take, problem is that would take away from the Michael yeah, yeah mental gymnastics between the inspector and our main character. The problem so. is a question of like focus, where you have to be able to resolve this plot. But in really, the, it, it like the fact of these two characters existing the way they do in the movie is unfortunate because they have a, a subplot that's kind of interesting but isn't really fully developed. And when they're excised from the movie, it just seems like they're tacked on here. Yeah, where it's like really we want the true climax of this movie to be like the dual scene we saw between Swan and Ray Milland, right? Except this time it's between Ray Milland and the inspector. And we want it to be a true sort of one-to-one relationship between those things, except that this time the inspector gets the upper hand. And we don't want it to be because of some stupid clue that he gathers off screen. We want it to be because it's a duel and Ray Milland was not able to out-duel him. Yes. Or even better... Maybe he was able to outdo both the inspector and the boyfriend. Right. But maybe they like join together and collectively they're stronger. Something. Mentally Something. Him. Something. Like I know that's kind of what happens, but no, not, not really. Cause boyfriend does nothing other than accurately p- figure out what he did with no evidence whatsoever. And then stumble into evidence. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, unfortunately, and I know this is a very, uh, sort of, strict adaptation of the material. But I feel like that is one place where unfortunately it is the con- like the literal like you know bones of the play that you would have to change. You'd have to outright change the dialogue and the dynamics that are happening, yeah. but I feel like that's the change that needs to happen. The the second half of the movie also has to be long scenes of one-on-one conversations. Because that makes this movie really really interesting. It does. And that's I think part of why stuff like rope works, right? Because that's obviously a stage play, but you have good actors in there and it's not one-on-one conversations, but it's all drawn out conversations that lead to the ultimate conclusion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas with this, even though it's more episodic than rope, you still have to rely on that same sort of, uh, I don't know, resource for creating something that's interesting to look at instead of the plotting because the plotting in this will never be able to overcome the actual strength of the performances or just the fact of these character dynamics. This is what are we supposed to be feeling in this scene? Cause this is the part that like, this is the exact opposite for me of the initial 22 minute dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. It just feels long. It's long. It's drawn out. We kind of already know where it's going. It's like, confusing. Yeah. It's like, it's hard to keep track of what the fuck is going on. That's why they have to explain it several times. It's like, oh, he forgot the key in the right place. And we'll explain it for you guys. What happened really is that the key he took from uh, Swan's body was the latch key to his own apartment. Was Swan, yeah, Swan's apartment. Yes. And he assumed that Swan mistakenly had, yeah. that it was the key Grace Kelly's key. Yeah. When in reality, Grace Kelly had taken... Well, or no, Swan had taken Grace Kelly's key after he opened the door and put it back under the carpet. Which was against instructions. Yes. He fucked up. So again, Ray Milan's assumption with that was that other people would follow the rules. But they didn't. Yes. And uh, that's what gets him caught. But also the aggravating thing about that is like ultimately the key is what does it, but then it's like you have all these other objects floating around in your brain. What about the suitcase? What about the... What about the letter? What about everything yeah, else? Yeah, what about the fact that when he planted the letter on Swan's body, he wasn't wearing gloves or anything, so he could have easily left fingerprints, one on the letter and two on Swan, which would have fucked him over completely? Like, I don't know. I mean, that I think is truly a nitpick. It is. That one. But, yeah. but like, that's just a dividing line no, between, like, like it, what is really it annoying. It wouldn't be if they hadn't made such a big deal out of fingerprints in the previous thing. Right. Or, like, mm-hmm. how about this? If you don't make such a, like, straightforward attempt at explaining the stuff with the objects here, right? It's okay for a movie to be convoluted as long as you're really going for that like character stuff. That's why The Big Sleep is a great movie. That yeah. movie makes no sense in a straightforward way, but that's okay because you're just watching these characters move through these different situations. And that's what you want from this movie. 
but you don't really get it in the second half. Don't worry, we're not going to kill you anymore. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you for showing emotion. I appreciate it. Yeah, and it's just like, I, I, it's just, yeah, I'm not really excited. It's, I'm not, I don't blame her. I blame the five total lines of dialogue she's allowed to have in the movie. It's just like. Well, it's an unfortunate thing with Hitchcock too, where it's like, this movie really demands a lot of the performances, but then you shortchange these roles. Yeah. So it's like, and these characters are just not good. She, Grace Kelly was given really like, really like small margin for error with this. It's like, unless you're like a really like amazing level actor, you're not going to be able to come off looking really good. I think from this role, I think, she does what she can do with it, but it's just like, there's just nothing there and Hitchcock doesn't give a fuck about directing you anyway. So I don't, I don't know. Just stand there. Yeah. And like, uh, yeah, all of this evidence is circumstantial. Like he could have, he literally could have been just like, I saw a key under the thing as I was turning around and yeah. I'm just like, Oh, I'm like, why don't I try that? Well, that's the thing again with all, a lot of Hitchcock movies is cause again, it's, it is truly circumstantial because it's like contriving circumstances to make you socially guilty. Right. Yeah. And really in his movies, that's why when we, you know, it is a little bit more aggravating here when they break the law so frequently, but it's like usually in his movies, cops are a representation of social authority. Right. And we buy the social authority that we see in them because of their legal authority, but they're more like a representation of the consequences that happen when you get judged by society at large or the public eye, right? You know, if it didn't happen that way, what would happen is you see these movies where these people are very paranoid about things. And then if you're an audience member who's like, yeah, but once you go through that and you're still alive, you're going to realize you are like catastrophizing or whatever. Right. But if you have a plot that is more involving cops, then that's not true because that's legitimate legal authority and there's consequences. Yeah. So it's a way to seal the deal with this type of drama. But it is more strained in this in this movie, certainly. And now we're literally at a point. How awkward would it be if he's just like, oh, my my plan didn't work? Well, that's the other thing. Is Sorry, like, miss. What if he just didn't do any of this? Yeah. Sorry, miss. You're going back to getting executed. We just keep breaking the law until they find him guilty and just hit him with his car. <laughs> we got you, you limey bastard. You're a limey bastard too. <laughs> but yes. Surprise! Ta-da! In a mirroring of the original scene of this movie, Ray Milland walks in and finds... But they're close this time. They don't have to hide it anymore. And his guilt is truly out in the open for everyone to see. Right. So it's a flip. It's a flip. Instead, He walks into the room, but instead his own guilt is revealed instead of yes. their guilt being revealed. But also that's part of the problem with her character, just to go off of what we were just talking about, is like she begins with a certain type of character arc expectation where she's having this affair, and then we just lose her character entirely. Yeah. Like we begin with her emotion. We get that really dramatic close-up shot on her, you know? If you watch the first scene of this movie and watch nothing else, you might walk away from this movie just being like, oh, th that's that movie with Grace Kelly being the star, right? Yes, but then the movie shifts right away from that. <laughs> and I do think it's interesting that they ultimately end the movie the same way, with the same, like, vicious sense of propriety. And then the little joke of this guy combing his... Mustache. His mustache. Which, as we know, is where he gets his power from. Yes. He would be a shit investigator without that mustache. I mean, honestly, he never like, shows a badge. Just so we like still Hitch don't know that he's an investigator. Yeah. Just like Hitchcock would be a shit director without those jowls. Those, all of his directing talent was stored directly in the jowls. Maybe. that's Maybe that's why he had such a good profile, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that has been Dilem for Murder. Not a perfect movie, but still plenty of interesting things. Very genuinely enjoyable. Um Yet again, yeah, not one of my favorite Hitchcock films, uh, but I'd, I'd watch it again. Um, I might check my phone for a little bit during some of the scenes toward the end, but other than that, like, yeah, the first three quarters of the movie, I would say, like, keep you really, really, really engaged. solid. I'd say the entire first half. Yeah. Really. 
But yeah, so this has been Dial In for Murder and the Spectator Film Podcast. You can mm-hmm. find us online at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher. Uh, and we are available on various social media platforms, including Twitter, Twitter Tumblr, and Instagram. And Letterboxd. We never yes. mentioned that, but we have Letterboxd. You should check it out. And uh, yeah, uh, definitely, you know, leave good reviews or whatever. Otherwise, Max will go crazy. It's the only thing holding him together is yeah, the good reviews. It's re- Which is really bad because we're not getting any reviews. So yeah, Much like Norman Bates, Max can only hold it together so long as he knows that we're going to get a good review eventually. Otherwise, he'll go around murdering people. No, but if you... <laughs> In all seriousness, if you do enjoy this podcast and have any suggestions for a movie you think might be interesting to have us talk about, leave a comment. We'd be more interested in that than a review because reviews are just like, listen, we know, we know, we know we, this podcast, this is not a career for us, but guess what? It's still more interesting to have some sort of interaction um, so we don't really care about the reviews as much, but we would be curious to hear uh, from any sort of audience about like suggestions for movies, but we're not doing Sallow and, uh, we won't be doing come and see. And we-